Good evening, everybody. I sincerely appreciate Tamir Masa's Dharma Master's wonderful question answer session. And uh, from now on, in the final stage of tonight's Dharma talks, uh, feel free to ask any questions you like. Can you please talk about love and, and compassion in our wealth practice? You are one of the most compassionate teachers I have ever seen. Why need me talk about that? For all sentient beings, not just for me. Wonderful. So, what is it that is common in all of us? That is the question, not to you, but to all beings, in order to find compassion. Many people believe that compassion is an emotional posture. Some specific, very sweet emotional package, like the food of your grandmother that you have always loved. And this is what we call emotional or emotion-based compassion. And it always involves the notion that something super nice and soft and tender will appear, which makes everybody feel good. And that's compassion, the shared feeling of goodness or support. That's not untrue, but very limited. Okay. Greater compassion involves all kinds of experiences, but never losing the experience that we have the same roots, we have the same human nature, we have the same Buddha nature, i.e. inside we all have the potential to wake up. So this potential to wake up and become Buddha, that kind of clarity, this kind of presence bind us together. It's much bigger than just good feelings. Sometimes you are compassionate and outside you display very strong speech, very strong emotions, very decisive actions. You're a father of three. I know your boys. You're compassionate with them all the time. And sometimes you have to be firm like a rock. And that firmness, sometimes even screaming at them with love inside your mind, that's also compassion. Because you see cause and effect, how it operates for all of us. Just like our Buddha nature, the Dharma is common for all of us. There is no special Dharma for a, an individual or a family or a group or a nation. We follow the same rules, whether we know it or not, whether we break them or keep them, we follow the same law. In this sense, that law is not different, whether it's written or unwritten. We call that the Dharma. And the manifestation of that is karma. So if we have karma, cause and effect that we do not like, that make us suffer, then where did we lose the notion of our Buddha nature that we all share, that is really common in us, that is the real bridge between us? Where did we lose that? What kind of attachment, what kind of false self-image is blocking that? And returning to this no name, no form, no body, no mind substance, is the root of compassion. So the oneness experience that we all strive for, that's the root of great compassion, regardless of what kind of emotions and thoughts and speech and actions you display. That's what we call great compassion. There is no I in it. There is no self-image in it. There is no notion of enlightenment or ignorance in it. Completely becoming one with the person or people around you perceive their minds, perceive their emotions, perceive their thoughts, and really hear what they have to say. Not just their words, but where those words come from. Now, if you have all the four channels of our personality clear, the actions, the speech, the thoughts, and the emotions, if that's clear in both relationships, that means from the environment to you and from you to the environment, then you have no separation. You have limits and borders, that's where you sit, that's where I sit. But we have no artificial separation. We have no ego wall, whether it's individualistic or family or a larger group. We do not make any false image, any false attachment. And therefore, we always have a bridge to each other. And that's not just the root of compassion, it's the root of wisdom too. Wisdom is not special. That's why Zen masters, they say, go ask a tree. I mean, you, did you really try that? Have you ever asked a tree in earnest, what is Zen? Like Joju said, go ask a tree. 
And you will have a beautiful answer, and by now you already understand that it won't be the tree talking to you. I mean, if yes, then soon come and talk to me, because then you need help. If the tree talks to you, then something is happening in your mind, you need help. That's what I'm here for. And if necessary, I give you other consultants and experts to receive assistance. But the point is, suddenly you realize how nature operates. And that is very compassionate because we share the same space, the same time, and the same, I should say, the same earth, basically. So compassion is really becoming one with the environment. And if you have human beings around you, you take their mind first. You perceive what kind of feelings they have, what kind of happiness or pain they have, and you try to help them. Why? This is, again, not your grandmother's favorite food. It's your basic self-interest. Why? It's not enough to finish your own suffering. If you do not help others finish their suffering, that comes through your door and breaks your house. I think where you guys live, it's very self-evident. And that's why we are doing what we are doing. And I'm proud of all of you, and I want to thank you and the Become One Society and all the Sangha that you truly strive for compassion, wisdom, equanimity, and based on that, peace. The foundation of peace determines how long it lasts and what it costs you. There's the kind of peace that costs tens of millions of lives. We have seen that in the last 100 years. Now, that kind of peace doesn't last because the roots of war were never eliminated. We never got down to the very foundation of our own existence and take out those illusions that we held as absolute. And those illusions keep poisoning our moment. And they reproduce war, famine, depletion of resources, all the suffering that's man-made and we can avoid. Because depending on the quality of our minds, we make this world. Clear mind, clear world, clear life. You do the math. That's why we are all here. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to know how can we bring the way of the Dharma and Zen also to more younger people, teenagers, maybe even children. Can you teach meditation? Kongans, can you teach such a complex... Um, thought change of thought process, process that Zen has to uh, younger minds than maybe have here. In Israel, you have a lot of fruit trees, figs, dates, apple, or so. Sometimes you see that these wonderful fruit, they are on the trees and they are ripening, they are growing, right? Can you make it grow faster? No. Good. Now, if you have that, you won't want to teach Zen to teenagers. You just want to answer their questions. It's enough first if you connect to them, even connecting to them, because their minds are so individualistic and so much loaded with zeros and ones. Even connecting to them is a very big job. So first, establish a clear human relationship. Build a channel. Once you have that, Earning their trust is the second most important thing, and you have to display a lot of good qualities to that. And then teach Zen invisibly. For Christ's sakes, don't start with Kongans. Because you display how smart you are, and they will go 10,000 miles away. You want to teach them meditation, and they shy away because they say it's so difficult, and I don't want to meditate. So then you ask them, what do you want? They want to be smart and successful and get the best boyfriend, girlfriend, and get a lot of money and be successful, i.e. they are selfish. Why? They are young. It's their job to be selfish. It's okay. We all went through it. So then find a way how to really help them. And the best way is to really answer the questions in a way that you leave them a little hungry. You don't pretend to know, but you point them to the right direction to find the answers for themselves. Then they realize, if they want to go through the desert, they need water, they need camels, they need a compass, and i.e., they have to be in a caravan. They cannot do it alone. So the moment that they realize they need to do some kind of together action, 
that is the start of decreasing their ego level. When they realize they have to work for their own answers, they become more humble, more industrious. If they realize that helping each other is key, they start to serve instead of just appropriate and possess. Relationships, you know, relationships are the greatest teachers. So if people are very clever and they have their own opinion and they want to be always right, usually they're always alone. And every single human mind has their own gateway. Find that. Then they will respect you, accept you. And since you didn't want to teach them, just help them find their own answers in their own way. They never think that you take something from them that they never wanted to give. Okay? So there's a lot of ways to help them. But be prepared for the unexpected. Be prepared for questions that... You cannot prescribe because they were never written down. And if you teach them Zen invisibly, then they will want to know, how can you do this? And then the tide turns. When they turn towards you, instead of just them wanting to know something special, how do you do this? Then you can slowly, slowly talk about meditation. Talk about methods. Don't feed them more than they can chew and swallow. And then some of them, very few, will want to practice Zen. And that's wonderful. So thank you very much for coming here together, practicing Zen. And uh, let us do this to the maximum possible extent to wake up and help all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.